But yeah, I, I guess I should also specify the change in light once again. It's about 7.50 in the morning. Because it's been another night of insomnia. And I just gave it up today. Gave up trying. So today is Vlogmas Day 19, which means it's Vastmas Day 8. Because my brain is just too full of The Last Jedi today, I had to write notes so that I could attempt to do the thing where I talk about the vast prompt thing. And I, I did try and talk about it a little bit this morning. Cut to an example of this morning here. And... and it, it explains so much about these characters. Well, all of the tales from Vast explain a lot about these characters in ways that the normal run of the the normal run of the narrative doesn't can't. But uh, team ups, duos. But I had too much of a bad brain thing going on, and I had too much of the after effects of insomnia. And the peculiar cacophony that a tiny kitten makes when they're just figuring out the kind of loudness she can create will totally aggravate my sensory processing disorder issues. Again, cut to the entertaining footage of this morning. The sound of all that ruckus is Ariel having discovered what it means to rampage at all hours of the day and night. And... <clears throat> Okay, we're just gonna roll with it. But here we go. I'm a try. We try and we try and we try. So there is going to be note reading here, just in case that wasn't clear. For the duos and team ups, clearly Marza and Visionary Destroyer are at the top of my list. I mean, seriously. I spent the last week talking about Marza and Visionary Destroyer. But since. I have spent so much time talking about the two of them, we're going to give them a break, and I'm going to talk about other team-ups and duos, but remember that they are my favorite favorites. So in no particular order, let's do the thing. Let's start off with Team Squishy from the Season 1 Unification Day to episode thing. I am here for Team Squishy and what the literal and metaphorical brains of the operation can do when they join together and have to keep each other relatively safe. Also, Niger just doesn't get enough love. So, you know, hug your friendly neighborhood brain in a jar. He's been having a rough time, but can we talk about for a moment that he nearly became the mother of the bountiful and thriving? He, he's not a slouch here, yo. I'm also totally here for the tree friends because Taka is wondrous and her trees are magical and her connection to the universe and what is right and what is necessary are so completely mixed up and connected to this might be an idea and noble defender. Just between you and me, I might actually have buttons made of these. But Leuven and Rake are always an interesting duo for me, especially their very first team up as tiny Kire Bebes in the Tales from Bast. I have a fascination with twins and twinnings. Please note, I am not a twin. God, can you imagine a universe where there are two of me? That's terrifying. But a lot of my academic career and a lot of my artistic and writing careers have been heavily influenced by theory. And by far, my favorite theoretical underpinning is alterity, which is basically a fancy way of saying othering, which is something that humans and pretty much all organisms do to a greater or lesser extent. Although humans are really the only ones that that practice othering as a socially regimented detrimental thing. And a place where we see a lot of alterity put into practice, literarily, is in the Gothic with its preoccupation with doppelgangers, the uncanny, and the other. Horror is often preoccupied with these things too, but gothic and horror are not necessarily the same things. Gothic often has a string of... has a string? The gothic often has a thread of horror, and horror often has a thread of the gothic. 
But this is part of the reason that Leuven and Rake are so interesting to me. They're this locus of doppelganger, the uncanny, especially with the Kirei insistence that they are one soul and two bodies, and otherness, which is snuck in spaces and places both benign and strange and dangerous in the narrative. Kirei companions, which I don't want to say sex slaves, but sex slaves, the sacrificing for an entire litter for a single chosen child who's deemed the most beautiful, that Leuven and Rake are twins in a culture in which singular, specially, almost eugenics level chosen children are the norm. Yet there's this cultural escape hatch for special cases like Leuven and Rake, but that doesn't protect them socially in the long run. It does lead to their first team up with each other and with Kraya, eventual team up of Kraya and Leuven. And the stark realization, despite our circumstances, that we don't all become monsters. But it's very easy to wander down that path when one is hurt and hurting, like Rake. And that it's much more difficult to take that rage and pain and abandonment and turn it into something constructive, like Kraya did. And yeah, this is a really surface paradigm that falls apart fairly quickly when you scrutinize it too hard. But there's also some truth there. That despite all of the good reasons and reasoning behind Rake's choices, there are choices made from pain. And there's an argument that all of Leuven's choices are made from pain too. Definitely Cryas. It's what we do with it, right? And I, th I think, really, that this might be part of the reason that Rake is so fascinated with Gaska. As well as the dice rolls, because, you know, the dice rolls, it is an RPG after all. <laughs> it's because a lot of Gaska's decision making is coming from a place of pain and a need to protect herself. But yeah, Leuven and Rake are fascinating, and their twin dynamic is also fascinating. The other team up that's really just intensely interesting to me is Merza and Noble. And yeah, it's short-lived and sort of really mostly a disaster and totally instigated by Viz because how else was it going to happen? And see how I managed to sneak Marza and Viz into this entire thing without actually making it about them? Aren't you proud? But it's also very telling about the characters. Marza and Noble's only point of commonality at this point in the narrative is Visionary Destroyer, Marza's bondmate and Noble Defender's sister, and both their queen. This is their axis, their fulcrum, the most important person in their in their lives, despite the shifting sideways a bit for Noble at this point. And when Viz says take care of each other, this means Merza almost killing themselves to protect Noble because this is their bondmate's precious squishy sibling. For Noble, it kind of means having a meltdown. Because while humans are adaptable, we are very adaptable creatures, we eventually just reach a point where it's too much. And Noble reached that point. So much of Noble's life was changing that he couldn't just accept one more thing without railing at his sister. And it's kind of understandable, but you're also sitting there going, dude, maybe not the time. However, because of Merz's understanding of Viz and Viz's necessity in keeping her brother alive, and because Noble understands his sister in a way that goes beyond siblinghood to this like soul deep friendship. It's a friendship forged in battle, opposing the the, the oppressive forces of the, the mother thing. Marisa and Noble figure out how to work together and how to make Viz proud in a way that only Viz can be proud. That, that was really long and maybe not the most coherent kind of explanation analysis of my the my fa mm, words of my favorite team ups but there you go there there are my favorites stay tuned tomorrow for another day of vastness which in which we're going to be talking about heroes which actually i think i'm going to kind of change it just a little bit and make it protagonists I, i'll explain tomorrow it, it, it's a thing that ha has to do with the definition of hero and heroic and yada 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 and I like protagonist. I will see you tomorrow with another video. Be kind, do good, be brave, courage.
don't knock on your desk when you're filming. That's, that's a poor choice. Watch me shuffle around for a little bit. <laughs> I feel like I should have a hat on. It's cold in this corner. 